All right, today we got the 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing, Violate Them at Your Own Risk by Al Rice and Jack Trout. Jack actually wrote another book called Positioning. He passed a couple years ago, but this is one of the great pioneers of marketing. This book's 30 years old. All right, it's almost 30 years old. And most of the products and companies that he talks about are gone. But the principles that made them great, all right, were the same exact principles they abandoned to become obsolete. So he talks about the attributes and the mistakes made in marketing. Hope you enjoy this. Uh, and these are new ideas that are old ideas. So you can repackage them and apply them because technology that you're watching me on right now and listening to us on right now didn't even exist in 1993. Hope you enjoy it. You know, Steve, if you violate these rules, it'll be at your peril. The 22 immutable laws of marketing. I read this whole entire book before I knew what the word immuta immutable meant. <laughs> I didn't what bother. does it mean? Well, I was always taught to look up a word. Immutable means you can't mute them. Yeah. Because when you talk about these laws in marketing in a company, they're going to want to talk you out of things. There's things in here that are, that are laws that they're, most of them are mistakes. And some of them are advantages, but they're either a big ex mis mistake or a big advantage. But they're all mutable, meaning immutable. So you can't you can't shut them up. I mean, they're just going to happen no matter what. And th th that's just at the end of the book. He talks about when you bring these laws to a company, if you already work somewhere and there's already an established product, the chances are you're going to get a lot of flap is high, right? And those are all the people that do well now, right? got to stay away from the crowded markets. What would you think? I thought it was great. I thought yeah. that it, the first law, the law of leadership, really actually flipped the whole script and what I thought because we just read something else a few weeks back or a few months back where it talked about you don't always want to be first because sometimes you, can, you see what they did wrong, but that's kind of uh, just a small detail, but he talks about being first is the way to go. Well, it, I think it's first so the mind remembered. The most remembered, right. I think, is a better place because who's the first person that crossed the... Uh, that the was great the example, ocean, yeah. and the Limburg, right? Yeah. And everyone yeah. knows that. There was lots of people that tried, probably landed in the ocean, but Limburg was the first one to make it. Right. Who was the second? Nobody knows. Who was the third? Amelia Earhart. Ah, <laughs> well, you I cheated. Read the book. I read, well, that was a great example because... Yeah. Amelia Earhart was she third. She was the third, but he also was another law of his, the law of category. So she wasn't the first, yeah. but she was the first woman. So it's yeah. another category you can think of in your market. Yeah, exactly. Um, so if you want to be remembered... There's lots of ways to be remembered. We talk about this in compelling, uh, compelling people and also in riveted, like what, what makes you riveting, you know, helping make money, save money, save time, connect with others and increase your status. Uh, so Amelia Earhart increased her status when she, when she uh, crossed the ocean first as a woman. Mm -hmm. The guy that was second, too bad. I mean, <laughs> he, he could have said the most unremembered pilot to do the most amazing thing. He could have had a campaign together. You might remember his name. I do not. Like, who was the first president? Right. I don't know. George Washington. Who was second? <laughs> I don't know second, actually. Who ran the first four-minute mile? <laughs> oh, oh, shoot. If I heard the name, I'd know, but it's a tough name. Roger Bannister. Who, who was the first person to name. land on the second, <laughs> on, the, on the moon? Who landed on the moon first? Uh, Neil Armstrong. Who was second? The, I know it too, but I can't remember as easily. Is that a Buzz Aldridge? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice job. So that's that's law number one, law of leadership. And there's twenty, there's twenty two. I want to speed date these. It's kind of fun just to rattle them off with uh, examples. But also these are these are examples from the nineties. This this book was written before most of the technology that exists today you're listening to this podcast on. If you're watching it on YouTube, it didn't exist in 1993. Yeah. Uh, all the equipment certainly didn't exist. And there was no way you could listen to a video or audio show on the mainstream airline for me without a lot, a lot of money. So things have happened, but the laws are, are undeniable. Um, and the second law is, it plays with the first one. It's the law of category. You know, if you, if you are, are second, you got to create a new category. I love that one. That you can really become cool. first at. I had a great, great, great example of this. And I never heard of this until about a year ago. Eddie, Eddie and I flew out to L.A. to meet with the guy that discovered Airborne. Mm. The, you know, the, the little, yeah, the, the little the pill. Thing. Yeah, the pill you take. or the, It's like a wafer. You eat it yeah. when you're on the airplane. <laughs> and he, you know, he found out that he had like a tea that 
that, uh, that, that did what airborne does. It built boosts your immune system with these herbs that were proven. And, and he, ho- he strolled the aisles of, of whole foods, which is what I always tell people to do when you're in a product space, stroll the aisles and see what's going on. And he saw all these herbal teas that did exactly what his product did. So he created a, a lozenger. So he created a new category of immune suppressants mm-hmm. um, or immune, what are they? Immune, immune system boosts. Yeah. And it was airborne. He just created a new category. Yeah, as, as we were getting his advice, that's just awesome. Like Dell did that in computers. IBM was first in computers, but Dell was the first p- first place to, s- to sell a computer over the phone. Right. Remember, they built a huge business just selling. You buy it, call up Dell and get a computer. Awesome. Uh, real quick, back to the law of leadership, the first law. He rat- rattled off a ton of examples. I have a couple here, but one thing that was really fascinating, for example, Xerox, Kleenex, Coke, Scotch tape. People ask for those things, even though they're the brand name, for the actual thing, like A1 sauce. Right. You, you know it as a sauce. You don't know it as the brand. So I thought that was really powerful. They own the, the, the word. They own the word. Yeah. And there's, there's, a, there's a few of these that overlap because um, it's, you know, it's a third law. Own the law, law of the mind. Own the word in your mind like... Um, you know, personal computers is owned by by Apple. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a good word. It's in the mind, like it's owned there. And there's uh, certain other things, uh, like take Coke owns cola. You know, Mercedes owns engineering. Yeah, Volvo owns safety. Domino's owns overnight delivery. FedEx owns the overnight package. Kleenex owns the tissue market. Yeah, like that's a giant thing. If you can own, if you're first to market, and you can own the mind. Yeah, uh, huge, huge, huge. One thing he's, uh, that was interesting, too, is uh, Steve Jobs, he created Apple. And one thing I remember reading in the book was uh, that that name is so simple, so easy to remember. And all mm-hmm. the other companies were like so convoluted and technical that they were like nobody remembers it. But Apple, they remember right away. Right. Yeah. I, it really fascinates me how Steve Jobs was able to kind of have that foresight. Like, I wonder what he was thinking when he came up with that name. I know there's some like theories and there's documentaries and stuff. But. My father was... Um bought me my first personal computer if you can believe it or not my dad never made over 40 grand in his life wow. and and when i was first in the insurance business everybody had a computer i didn't have any money and he went down to radio shack which doesn't exist anymore and he bought me a tandy computer which also doesn't exist because radio shack was known for technical parts at the time talk about our company that that did what's called line extension, which is another law. They just stretched themselves too thin. Instead of being like a component store where you can go in and get adapters and, and cables and things like that for electronics and computers, they started building computers. But I remember he put, he put $4,000 for a little 20 megabyte computer on his credit card. Wow. It was just the most amazing thing. I'll never forget that he did that. He knew nothing about computers, but he yeah. believed in me. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I love it. My, you know, I lost him a year ago this past October, but I'll never forget that we went to Radio Shack, which doesn't exist, bought a Tandy <laughs> computer, which doesn't exist, but the computer and what it did changed my life. I built big businesses out of that. But um, now if you, can't own, if you can't own the word, like, uh, like McDonald's owns fast food, McDonald's also owns uh, kids. Oh, yeah, that was weird, line. yeah. Yeah, so he says own the opposite. Mm-hmm. So Burger King started uh, started a campaign to appeal to like kids over ten, yeah, and they started owning that, and they couldn't own Burger Soul, but they, then they competed against the Whopper versus the Big Mac, so yeah. they started owning the bigger burger. Reminds me of the kind of jumping around, but it reminds me of when they the law where. Uh, what was it called? I forget the name of it, but where they you own it, the law of candor. I think it was when you're honest with what it yeah. is and you're wrong. Talk about right. that one. Do you remember well, that Avis was known for that. Like they, 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 they were weren't. They were always going to be second. Yeah. They were the long, long second. <laughs> yeah. And they said, "One more second, we try harder." That's so funny. Yeah. And Listerine did it too. That's the one I like Listerine was horrible, and mm-hmm. Scope came into the market. I remember when Scope came into the market, and I don't even think we even used mouthwash back then. Mm-hmm. We just brushed our teeth, but. I remember tasting Listerine a couple of times as a kid. It was horrible, like yeah. medicine. And they acknowledged it. They said, you know, horrible. What was they saying? They said oh, bad, bad taste twice a day yeah, something for clean get, breath. Yeah. You know, it was worth it. And then, what I liked <laughs> they acknowledged it. Yeah, the candor makes you think, that, well, if it tastes bad, it's got to be good for you. Right. And that actually plays to me a lot because I, I eat a lot of healthy food. And so whenever I have something, when it tastes worse, I almost think it's got to be better because it has no flavor. It's got nothing. It's not, doesn't have anything. So what was, what's the, what's the air freshener? That, that, Febreze? Uh, Febreze. Febreze. Yeah. yeah. Do you, you know the Febreze story? No. Febreze was uh, adopted from NASA, discovered Febreze. It was a chemical that they put on the space shuttles when mm-hmm. they came back from space. They smelled like horrible. <laughs> I'm, not sure, uh, I'm not sure that NASA invented it, but it was an invention. Yeah. 
But it did that. NASA was a big first client because it completely removed the smell. Wow. And they tested it and tested it and tested it. And people, it worked perfectly well. And they went into a lady's house and she had cat stench in there. She did not recognize the cat stench, right? And they did. And they removed the cat stench and she didn't notice it. And it never sold very well until they added, like it did such a good job of removing smell, there was no smell. So they added a clean smelling after him. Gotcha. Yeah, and that's what made Febreze big. It was the very best technology, oh, but people are always, you got to understand, it's the perception, um, what people want. They don't want the product. They want the outcome. And anytime you're starting a business, you don't want to start with what your product does, you know, what, what gadget it or widget it does is what outcome is it going to be? And it's usually some version of, Happiness, health, success, wealth, connection, uh, speed of saving time. So it's always an outcome. Is it going to save time, save money, connect with more people, um, elevate your status? Those are th that's the perception. A lot of people always talk about what the product uh, does instead of what the outcome is. I thought that was a big deal. Yeah, and of course, yeah. These I'm looking at a summary. They're kind of overlapping. There's a law of uh, focus, which is you can only own one word in the prospect's mind. There's the law of exclusivity. Two companies cannot own the same word, but it's good. You, you see it from, you attack it from all different angles to know why. Yeah, I think I could break these down into about 10. Yeah. Because <laughs> some of them overloop. But one, one in particular is like the focus. You know, when you chase two rabbits, they both get away. I'm going to do a TikTok video about yeah. this tomorrow. Oh, that was a tomorrow good the, in the book. Tomorrow the next day is focus and, you know, talk about categories is niching. So if you, own, if you own a small enough niche, I mean, now technology has made it available so much so that somebody can go way, way out into a niche. The problem with niches, you couldn't, in a little geographic marketplace, you couldn't connect with enough people. But now the internet makes it possible to connect with a lot, a lot of people. And, you know, that is a powerful process to... Um, you know, bring your products. Amazon started as an online company selling books, but he also had books. He was connecting rare books to the to the buyer. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the example I saw was in the movie space, like eighty a movie theater industry, like the drive-in movie and, and cinemas can only handle about one hundred and twenty movies at a time. But every year is about ten thousand movies. So most of them used to be seen in these festivals. You know, you go to a movie festival, and now with all the other alternative distributions, it allows you to be more niche and more focused, and you can scale it worldwide. So here's a book from 1993 that says, you know, be, you know, be the one and be in a niche and, you know, create a category. But now the technology exists for small players to get at this because the last law, the law of resources, talks about because that's one that did, did kind of time out. Mm -hmm. Most of these didn't, but I think this one did. It said, if you have a good idea and you don't have a lot of money, you might as well forget it. Mm. And the reality is that's not true at all with social platforms now. You know, the, the, the common person can have uncommon results. That's a good question. Is there, any, is there any law in here that you disagree with now as the time passed on? That was the, o that was the, that one, that was the only one that I, that I kind of... Uh, didn't connect with because I would have back then because I've had you know I I would have I would have invented a company called Select Quote. Mm -hmm. I had the, the the system the framework to do it through the mail, which is basically a mass quoting insurance company. So that was a hundred million dollar company. I didn't have the money to build out this the infrastructure. So if I had the resources and that idea, I could have been big because I came up with that idea around when they did. I think I could have been first to market. I could have built at least a, a competitor. Um, but I didn't have the resources. Now, if I if I had that idea, I could hire someone in India or China or Russia to build out the software for hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars, small money, and build a business that I can scale online. So I agree. I disagree with that one completely. Because of social media. Yeah, and then there's another one in there, Law Twenty, about hype. You know, he says, you know, what what's the situation in the press is usually the opposite of reality. But he talks about how hype, like good products, don't need hype. Yeah. I think hype didn't sell then. I think hype's a big part of marketing today, particularly yeah. influencer marketing, which didn't exist in 1993. Right. Um, but that's a cool, you know, that's a cool, uh, 
you know, a, a cool positioning. Everything in this book's about positioning. You know, yeah. where do you want to be? You want to try to be first. If you're not first, you create a category. You want to go niche if you can. You want to be focused. And then there's another another ad he talks about where it's uh, attribute. You want to be known for something. You ever been to the restaurant with me? Mm-hmm. What yeah. do I ask first? Uh, what are you known for? Every time. <laughs> if I'm in a restaurant with you and you're and you're and you're and I don't ask this question, I'll give you a thousand bucks. When the waiter walks up, <laughs> well, if you've been, not if you've been there before, because yeah, right, <laughs> right, right. But it, but if it's a new restaurant, the waiter walks up before they say anything. I say, hey, hey, what are you known for here at Joe's or whatever? Like I just was at uh, Jimmy, Billy, Billy Stone Crab. Oh, okay. I said, what are you known for here? I knew the yeah. answer was Stone Crab, but then he goes into, you're either going to get a raving, a raving answer if the waiter really is excited or you're going to get a, a bad answer, but you want to be known for something. And that's called the strategy of preeminence. And, but he calls it attribute, the law of attribute. Like, mm-hmm. And the best way to, there's always attributes that you could own in the marketplace, like Crest owned fighting cavities. Right. And then they had uh, AIM. I don't know if you remember AIM. AIM came out with a good tasting toothpaste. I remember we used to want AIM. It looked like candy. It was all swirled. It was mm. green and white. It looked like candy. Like we, we almost wanted to eat it. And then for people that had horrible teeth, it was ultra bright. For white teeth, it was a whitener, early whitener. And then there was one, uh, it was a picture that the toothpaste was called close up. And it was a picture of someone's mouth really close up to near another one. Yeah. And all I could think is, least I hope they have good breath. Yeah. So it was for breath. So that was the, the that. law of attribute. And these can all be combined into, you know, into, um, you know, into, into a process that makes your product better, you know, more memorable. Because marketing and product quality have nothing to do with one another. Yeah. They really don't. You know, I mean, people contest that, but it's, it's, really, it's really that. You know, the, the Law 17 says you can't predict the future unless you're looking at your competitor's business plan. You can't comp- predict the future no matter what. And the one that's the most fun where the money is made in this, in this book is if you can ever just step away and examine the marketplace, just like the lion. You always heard me talk about this when it's marketing. When I'm doing marketing coaching, I always say, think of yourself as a lion, right? And the lions in Africa, as I went to Africa and the guide said, you don't see lions very much. They don't run around like wild animals, even though they're wild animals. They kind of bed down and they just watch and observe and they look and they're looking for weaknesses in a herd. They're looking for a place where they could separate the herd and create a win, a known predictable win to break that herd off. Marketing's that way. And in, in law 22, um, I forget what the law is, but it's about fads and trends. Law of resources. No, law 21 then. Oh, law of acceleration. What's the one? No. What's the law of... <laughs> Extension? It's the law, law of acceleration. Yeah. Oh, yeah, acceleration. It's what we would call scaling. Uh, but it talks about the difference between fads and fashion and trends and waves. I love that, yeah. Yeah, so the lion would see the trend coming, like a predictable... Which is the ocean. Yeah, the trend, the the trend is the ocean rising, not the wave coming. Just one single The wave, wave. will come and go, yeah. and it'll keep coming and going here and there, but then it'll change. But the trend is your friend. The trend is what's coming next. Like if we were ever to predict the virtual nature of the conditions that we're in right now, we could have been in the virtual business at the beginning of the year, mm-hmm. and now it's created this massive, massive trend to learn how to work from anywhere. I actually built the whole product around that, you know, the anywhere system, how to work from anywhere and do well. Um, But a trend um, is your friend. In Wall Street, that's what they say. Fads come and go. You know, there there was an example like the fad, the fad of the ice bucket challenge was was one book one I heard on a a podcast from someone else was talking about this book. You know, it came and when it it came and it went, but it created a trend. The trend was challenges. Mm. Like challenges came out of that. That was a trend. So challenges became a marketing thing because, you know, millions and millions of people uh, got behind that, that cause. Uh, you know, fads come and go and never come back. Fashion comes and goes and comes back. Like right. the mini skirt or the three-piece suit. Yeah. There's fashion. Like it's Haley's Comet. It'll come back. In my world, it's the short shorts. It was like NBA players used to wear short shorts yeah. when, uh, back in the day. Then yeah. they got longer. And now That's they're back fashion, short yeah. shorts. <laughs> That's interesting, too, because I got out of corporate America. And then I was doing some videos one day. I used to t- I went to yoga and I had my shirt tucked in. Yeah. <laughs> and then and this girl was looking at me a little weird. She goes, we don't tuck our shirts in anymore. I was like, well, I haven't been to yoga. Yeah. I have never been to yoga. Yeah. <laughs> 
so took her shirts in. That's like such I'm a like, well, what do I do with it? Yeah. Um, I was I think, hiding my gut. Yeah, I think the big idea that we have left is the law, the law of extension. Oh, the law of extension was um, brand extension. Yeah. It's like you cannot ride your trend into all categories. Like yeah. you just can't. That You'll extend yourself too thin. The best example of this, which this author would never have predicted that the guy that he made the most amount of fun of would be the current president. Because Donald Trump, uh, when he built, got rich in real estate, started putting his name on everything. He had an airline. He had a travel company. He had a helicopter business. He had hotels. And he, and he went broke. He extended his brand too much. The brand equity does not always extend into other categories. And the best example that I saw was A1. You know, A1's, A1 owned the space in the mind for steak sauce, quality steak sauce, became the actual verb, yep. became the noun. Uh, you know, whatever it is, they own the word steak <laughs> sauce. Give me some A1, right? Yeah. I don't know what the hell I said, right? Uh, and Coca-Cola did it when they, they wanted to go into like different versions of it, right? Yeah, and I was going to say, the, the interesting one was Atari. They're known for video yeah. games, but then they tried to like, back out. Yeah, they yeah. switched it too soon, and then they're known for this, and they were kind of screwed. Now and they're so, known for nothing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like AOL did it too. Uh, AOL, so was, AOL was the first email. You know, you've got mail. Yeah. Like they owned email <laughs> and then they started going into like media and TV shows and they went gone. Yeah. That's the 22 laws. What, did, what was your big takeaway from this? I think uh, it reminded me of Built to Sell as well, where you do one thing, you don't, um, you don't find people and then build products around them. You build one product, stick with it, and then let people find you. And the less you do, the more you do. And also, if you stand for everything, you stand for nothing. That's like Hamilton. Yeah. <laughs> if you stand for nothing, Burr, what do you fall for? If you haven't seen the show, man, you got to see Hamilton. It's wild. Um, yeah, this is a this is a big big time uh, big time book that was written 1993. So is that 40? Is that 40, 37 years ago? No. 27. Yeah. 1993. Yeah. 27 years. So it's almost 30 years ago. So a lot of things didn't exist. I'm living proof you can get through life without being good at math or spelling. <laughs> I always have people that get hyper, like emotional about my spelling errors. One guy, yeah. one guy, like flipped out because I forgot to dot an I in one of my videos. Oh, like the TikTok ones, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Stuff wrong. <laughs> There's a lot of. You want to learn about a lot of idiots? Go on TikTok and read the comments. It also, could be marketing that you're purposely leaving it in there. Of course, yeah, yeah I do it on purpose. <laughs> but if you want to work backwards from awesome and you're creating a new product and. You, it'd be a big mistake not to look at these laws and just get simple, pull four of them out and design a product that has niche that is perhaps in its own new category and it's focused and you own, own an attribute in a marketplace because there's always an attribute that's not taken in any marketplace. All right, man, and girls and ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> everybody listening, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us this week. <laughs>